All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. I hope that you are having a great and wonderful morning. And so happy to be in the land of the living. As you can see, probably on most of my broadcasts, I have been uh, toning down the lights and just enjoying some natural light. And so uh, I hope that you are having a great and wonderful morning. So I want to say good morning to those of you who are faithful Daring Dialogue followers. Good morning, Mr. Pastor Ben. Good morning, uh, Minister Ernie Perry. Good morning. Love the profiles, pictures coming up here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is Friday. It's a wonderful Friday. I am happy to be alive. Welcome, Prophet Jonathan. Uh, good morning, Kingdom 66. I believe that is Lady Barbara. Good morning, good morning. I hope that you all are having a fabulous day. Listen, last night I began to... Um, go into our cross-training sessions, which are going to be um, several sessions throughout August and part of September. So please go back and watch that replay or share that replay with someone who has just given their life to Christ. I did get some emails this morning from people um, who did watch the um, cross-training session, and I am excited because there are believers out here who are new to the faith and they really do want to know, I'm saved, so now what? So please make sure you pass on that replay, copy the link, share it to your uh, social media pages. All right? Um, so right now we are looking at today's topic is going to be the Canvas Strategy. I was going to get into some other topics today, but um, this was to me, a very powerful lesson uh, for business. So I wanted to just, I want to take the time to go over this particular thing called the Canvas strategy um, and share it with you all because I believe it will help you regardless of if you are in business or if you own your own business or not, just some of the principles and things that are laid out in the telling of these experiences, I believe will help you anywhere you are in life. I also want to let you know um, that at the end of today's broadcast, I will do um, my last drawings for the week. Um, so I hope that you are prepared and are ready to think a little bit as we go into uh, giving these drawings away. And then all of my products that were given away we have given away yesterday and today we will get those out to um, those who won on Monday so for yesterday the winners from yesterday were Prophet uh, Pastor Ben and uh, Lady Margaret I think if she's on here today I'm not sure if she's on here um, but they were the two that uh, your names were pulled and the answer to the question of how many books are in the New Testament was 27. All right. So that was the answer for yesterday. So next week, next Wednesday, this is a plug for ladies. Okay. We're going to do, I'm going to do a special segment on black women and our health. I need you to let every black woman, you know, uh, know about that broadcast on Wednesday. Um, I was going to do, again, I was going to do some things today, but then I decided that the information that I'm going to share is too important to just regulate to a few minutes. So next Wednesday, I am going to do a segment on black women's health. Ladies, we need to talk. And um, the information that I'm going to be sharing came directly from some important sources, and I'll get into that on Wednesday, and I'll share a little bit of um, my own experience and we're going to be talking about black women's health because there are some things that we are not being told that the sooner we get the information the better off we will be 
All right. And so I'm going to leave it at that. But I encourage you, you don't want to miss next Wednesday because I'm going to be sharing information that you are not being told as a black woman. All right. And so now that I know, I feel an obligation to share that information out with other black women so that we can um, be in better control of our own health. Because anybody knows this, knowledge is power and applied knowledge is even more power. So I don't want you to just get the information. Hopefully as you hear what I have to say and share with you, you will take some action for your own life. All right. So Wednesday, next Wednesday is going to be Black Women's Health. Ladies, we need to talk. All right. So let's get into today, the Canvas Strategy. And I am reading from Tools of Titans. Let me take my little sticker off here. Tools of Titans, I recommend this book. It is an excellent book. It is broken into three parts, Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise. Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise. And I believe I am in the uh, Wealthy section where he's talking about business and business principles. Um, the subtopic is the tactics, routines, and habits of billionaires, icons, and world-class performers. And so he is going to share with us today something called the Canvas Strategy, or in the words of Kendrick Lamar, sit down and be humble. <laughs> um, that was one of the things I got out of here. So let us begin. Great men have almost always shown themselves as ready to obey as they afterwards proved able to command. I'll read that again. Great men have almost always shown themselves as ready to obey as they afterwards proved able to command. And that quote is from Lord Mahon. Um, what does he mean by that? When I, I think about that, I think about there's a particular scripture in the Bible. I believe it's in Luke chapter 16, where it talks about we must first be able to be faithful over another man's work before God will give us a work of our own. And so he says this in this section, if you want great role models, you have to become a great follower. If you want to lead, you have to first learn to follow. Ben Franklin, legendary NFL coach, Bill Belichick, and many of the historical figures that you think of as leaders followed a single strategy in their early days. I used the same strategy to build my network. It also explains how my first book hit the tipping point and it can be credited for my success in tech investing. Ryan Holiday calls it the canvas strategy, and he is a master practitioner himself. A strategist and writer, Ryan dropped out of college at 19 to apprentice under Robert Greene, author of The 48 Laws of Power, and became director of marketing for American Apparel at 21. His current company, Brass Check, has advised clients like Google, Taser, and Complex as well as many best-selling authors. Holiday has written four books, most recently, Ego is the Enemy and The Obstacle is the Way, which has developed a following among NFL coaches, world-class athletes, political leaders, and others around the world. He lives on a small ranch outside of Austin, Texas. In the Roman system of art and science, there existed a concept for which we have only a partial analog. The successful businessmen, politicians, or playboys would subsidize a number of writers, thinkers, artists, and performers. More than just being paid to produce works of art, these artists performed a number of tasks in, ex in exchange for protection, food, and gifts. One of the roles was that of an anteam bulo, A N. T-E-A-M-B-U-L-O, Antim Bulo, literally meaning one who clears the path. This person proceeded in front of his patron anywhere they traveled in Rome, making way, communicating messages, and generally making the patron's life easier. 
All right. So in terms of understanding this concept, if you are spiritual, uh, you would probably see this person maybe as an armor bearer. All right. So this is the person that communicates messages, makes the patron's life easier, um, gets to places before the patron does to make sure things are in order. The famous epigrammist Marshall fulfilled this role for many years, serving for a time under the patron Mila, a wealthy businessman and brother of the Stoic philosopher Seneca. Born without a rich family, Marshall also served under another businessman named Petulius. As a young writer, he spent most of his day traveling from the home of one rich patron to another, providing services, paying his respects, and receiving small payments and favors in return. Here's the problem. Like most of us with our internships in entry-level positions, or later on, publishers or bosses or clients, Marshall absolutely hated every minute of it. He seemed to believe that this system somehow made him a slave. Aspiring to live like some country squire, like the patrons he serviced, Marshall wanted money and an estate that was all his own. There he dreamed he could finally produce his works in peace and independence. As a result, his writing often drags with a hatred and bitterness about Rome's upper crust from which he believed he was cruelly shunted. For all of his impotent rage, what Marshall could not see was that it was his unique position as an outsider to society that gave him such fascinating insight into Roman culture that it survives even to this day. Instead of being pained by such a system, what if he'd been able to come to terms with it? What if he could have appreciated the opportunities it offered? Nope, it seemed to eat him up inside instead. It's a common attitude that transcends gender generations and societies. The angry, unappreciated genius is forced to do stuff he or she doesn't like for, he, for people he or she doesn't respect, and they make their way in the world. How dare they force me to grovel? This injustice and what a waste. We see it in recent lawsuits in which interns sue their employers for pay. We see kids more willing to live at home with their parents than to submit to something they're overqualified to work for. We see it in an inability to meet anyone else on their terms and unwillingness to take a step back in order to potentially take several steps forward. I will not let them get one over on me. I'd rather we both have nothing instead. It's worth taking a look at the supposed indignities of serving someone else. Because in reality, not only is the apprentice model responsible for some of the greatest art in the history of the world, everyone from Michelangelo to Leonardo da Vinci to Benjamin Franklin has been forced to navigate such a system. But if you're going to be the big deal you think you're going to be, isn't this a rather, rather trivial temporary position? When someone gets his first job, or joins a new organization, he's often given this advice. All right? You can actually put some hearts on the screen, or you can put a hand up if you have ever heard this advice. Make other people look good, and you will do well. Keep your head down, they say, and serve your boss. Naturally, this is not what the kid who was chosen over all other people for the position wants to hear. It's not what a Harvard graduate expects. After all, they got that degree precisely to avoid this supposed indignity. Let's flip, flip it around so it doesn't seem so demeaning. It's not about kissing butt. <laughs> it's not about making someone look good. It's about providing the support so others can be good. I'm going to sip my lemonade on that. <laughs> It's not about making someone look good. It's about providing the support so they can actually be good. The better wording for the advice is this. Find canvases for other people to paint on. Be an Antine Bulo. Clear the path for the people above you and you will eventually create a path for yourself. Now, I didn't know that this was an actual strategy, but this is something that I do quite often. 
I call it networking other people who should know each other. Um, I may not have the particular information that a person needs, but I am very good at finding a person who has a problem and the person who has the solution and putting them together and connecting them together. I am very good at introducing people to people that they need to know. That is a part of um, what I do. And I don't see it as, oh, if I introduce these two people, then they owe me something, right? But oftentimes I know that people act that way, that, you know, if you got somebody in the door, you help somebody to connect with something, then all of a sudden they owe you something. No, they don't, all right? Understand your place in the scheme of things. You might be a puzzle piece, or you might be the person who puts the puzzle pieces together, but the reality is everybody is going to benefit from that connection, even if you are not directly involved in that connection. And I think that sometimes people do not understand that. So this is actually uh, pretty awesome that they're, they're talking about this because I'm going to say it again. He said, find canvases for other people to paint on. You don't have to be the canvas. Just find the canvases for other people to paint on. Clear the path for the people above you, and you will eventually create a path for yourself. Listen, if you are confident in who you are, if you know what you're called to do, understand that your time to present it will come. All right? It will come. When you are just starting out, we can be sure of a few fundamental realities. Number one, you're not nearly as good or as important as you think you are. Let me take some lemonade sip on that. In other words, sit down and be humble. <laughs> Number two, you might have an attitude that needs to be readjusted. So, yeah, you might be good or you might be bright, or you might be intelligent, but you got a bad attitude. And so that attitude is one thing that will sink you faster than anything else. Do you know how many gifted, talented, and skilled people never get used because they have a bad attitude? Put some hearts on the screen if you know what I'm talking about. There are plenty of people in this life that are very talented, very skilled, very gifted, but people take one look at their attitude, either it's ego or it's cockiness or it's um, condescending to other people or they don't know how to um, talk to people properly. They insult people or they put people down or they are not discreet. They don't know how to keep information confidential. All of those things are things that people look at when they're trying to decide who they want to promote. So, again, you may not be nearly as good as you think you are. You might have an attitude that needs to be readjusted. But most of what, and number three, most of what you think you know, or most of what you learned in books is in, in school is either out of date or wrong altogether. Hmm. I know that to be true. <laughs> um, it wasn't until I started reading and researching myself, which I've been doing for um, close to 20 years now. It wasn't until I became a researcher myself that I learned that a lot of things that we had been taught in school was simply not true or the information was out of date. So what do you do with that? If you have graduated from college and half of what you learned is already out of date because of technology, because of how information is moving so quickly, because of new discoveries, right? So at some point when you're just starting out, either one of these things could be true about you, okay? And some of us don't wanna look ourselves in the, in the mirror and really self-assess, where am I? Is what I know out of date? 
Do I need to go get some more schooling? Do I need to go get some more training so that I can be um, more valuable in this particular day and age? There's one fabulous way to work all of that out of your system. Attach yourself to people and organizations who are already successful. Subsume your identity into theirs and move forward simultaneously. It's certainly more glamorous to pursue your own glory, though hardly as effective. Obedience is the way forward. That's the other effect of this attitude. It reduces your ego at a critical time in your career, letting you absorb everything you can without the obstructions that block other people's vision and progress. No one is endorsing psychophancy, all right? Instead, it's about seeing what goes on from the inside and looking for opportunities for someone other than yourself. Remember, the term antibulo means clearing the path, finding the direction someone already intended to head and help them pack, free them up to focus on their strengths. In fact, making things better rather than simply looking as if you are. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I won't ask you to give away your sources, but I'm quite sure many of us have seen people who have been in position where they make they are looking as if they're making someone better when in actuality they're not they're simply there for an opportunity and what he's talking about is don't simply look like you want to make a person better actually be about the business of doing it don't act like you're on the person's side in the workplace and be behind the scenes trying to sabotage everything they do Unfortunately, this happens a lot in ministry. Um, people will join a ministry in that first. It will appear like they are on your side. And then you'll start to see little things going wrong. Maybe someone is not getting your messages, right? Or things that are supposed to be uh, happening on a deadline or something like that. All of a sudden, the deadline gets missed. Or an event that you're planning uh, consistently tanks every single year and you start realizing that the common denominator is one or two people that you keep putting on an assignment to get something done and they, they're in your face every day and they're telling you how much they love you. They're present, but they're not being helpful. They're present, but they're not clearing the path. They're actually obstructing the path. And unfortunately, I know in the world of ministry, a lot of times people don't realize who their obstructors are until it's almost too late, until that person or persons has performed so much sabotage in the background that it takes years sometimes to recoup or recover from the damage that was done based on just thinking that a person is present there for you. Or because a person compliments you, they are for you. So what he's talking about is really making things better for a person's life rather than simply looking as if you're trying to make it better. Because eventually your actions and your fruit will begin to show and it will begin to demonstrate or whether or not you have been an actual help or if you have been an obstruction to whatever the person is trying to get done. Many people know of Benjamin Franklin's famous pseudonymous, pseudonym, uh, <laughs> pseudonymous letters written under names like Silence Dogwood. Yes, sabotage. All right. So Benjamin Franklin used to write under a pseudonym Silence Dogwood. Okay. What a clever young prodigy, they think, and they missed the most impressive part entirely. Benjamin Franklin wrote those letters and submitted them by sliding them under the print shop door and received absolutely no credit for these letters until much later in his life. In fact, it was his brother, the print shop owner, 
who profited from their immense popularity, regularly running them on the front page of his newspaper. Franklin was playing the long game, learning how public opinion worked, generating awareness of what he believed in, crafting his style and tone and wit. It was a strategy he used time and over again in his career, once even publishing in his competitor's paper in order to undermine a third competitor. For Franklin saw the constant benefit in making other people look good and letting them take credit for your ideas. Bill Belichick, a four-time Super Bowl winning head coach of the New England Patriots, made his way up the ranks of the NFL by loving and mastering the one part of the job that coaches disliked at the time, and that was analyzing film. His first job in professional football for the Baltimore Colts was one he volunteered to take without pay, and his insights, which provided ammunition and critical strategies for the game, were attributed exclusively to the more senior coaches. He thrived on what was considered grunt work, asked for it, and strove to become the best at it, precisely what others thought they were too good to do. He was like a sponge, taking it all in, listening to everything, one coach said. You gave him an assignment and he disappeared into a room and you didn't see him again until it was done. And then he wanted to do more, said another coach. As you can guess, Belichick started getting paid very soon. Before that, as a young high school player, he was so knowledgeable about the game that he functioned as a sort of assistant coach even while playing. Belichick's father, himself an assistant coach for the Navy, taught him critical lessons in football politics. If he wanted to give his coach feedback or question a decision, he needed to do it in private and self-effacingly so as not to offend his superior. He learned how to be a rising star without threatening or alienating anyone. Somebody needs to write that down. <laughs> he learned how to be a rising star without posing a threat to anybody or without alienating people because he was rising in the ranks. And if you think that's easy to do in any profession, just keep living. <laughs> He learned how to be a rising star, I'm going to say it again, without threatening anyone or without alienating anyone. Because oftentimes when people, when you begin to rise in your particular profession or career, either you're going to find people are threatened by you or either you're going to find people alienating themselves from you because they feel like you are better than them or they're projecting, you know, their own uh, ideas about themselves. And so sometimes people withdraw from you. Sometimes people will say things like, you're out of my leagues now. I don't know if anybody has, has heard that, but people will start doing that. They'll start pulling back from you and you haven't changed your position on how you feel about them, but because you are rising and they don't feel that they're, they're no longer on your level, they will either feel threatened by you, or they will begin to alienate themselves from you. They'll begin to withdraw their support. They'll begin to withdraw their communication. All right, so this is very real, a very real thing. In other words, he had mastered the canvas strategy. You can see how easily entitlement and a sense of superiority, the trappings of ego, would have made the accomplishments of either of these men impossible. All right? So had Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, been caught up in his ego, or had uh, Mr. Belichick been caught up in his ego, it would have made their accomplishments pretty difficult to achieve. Franklin would have never been published if he prioritized getting credit over Creative expression. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Indeed, when his brother found out, he literally beat him out of jealousy and anger. I'm going to say that again. Benjamin Franklin would have never been published 
if he prioritized getting credit over creative expression. There are people who I have written for as a ghostwriter whose name is on the book. That's what a ghostwriter does. They don't, in other words, they don't take the credit for the writing. They help that person to accomplish their goal so they can get published, so they can receive the credit and acclaim. So if you're a person that always has to get credit for everything that you do, I would strongly consider taking a lesson from Ben Franklin and Mr. Belichick. Belichick would have ticked off his coach and then probably have been benched if he had one-upped him in public. He certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have taken his first job for free and he wouldn't have sat through thousands of hours of film if he cared about status. Greatness comes from humble beginnings. It comes sometimes from your grunt work. It means you're the least important person in the room until you change that with results. Somebody say, change your importance by getting results. Change your importance by getting results. And we know this in our own lives. They call it the canvas strategy, but most people practice this in their own lives. There are certain people that you will come to and you will give information to and you will confide in. Why? Because they know how to get results. There are certain people that you will bring private matters to in prayer. Why? Because they know how to hold your confidence and they know how to get results. Okay? There are certain people you wouldn't trust as far as you can throw them <laughs> because they don't know how to hold your confidence and you never see results coming from their life. That's what they're talking about here. Be, the le be willing to be the least important person until you can change that with results. Don't walk into a room saying, I'm the biggest and I'm the baddest and you have no proof and you have no fruit. There is an old saying, say little, but do much. Mm, that's something to practice for the rest of our lives, right? Say little, do much. What we really ought to do is update and apply a version of that to our early approach. Be lesser, do more. And as you can tell, this is not a concept that doesn't have an ancient foundation. Let me show you where the ancient foundation comes from. Let's see. <clears throat> Be lesser, do more. Who does that sound like? <clears throat> oh, yes. Let's see. There it is. Let's see if you can figure out who this is. All right. This is where it's coming from. <clears throat> A man can only get what God gives him. You yourselves heard me say, I am not the Christ, but I am the one sent to prepare the way for him. The bride belongs only to the bridegroom, but the friend who helps the bridegroom stands by and listens to him. He is thrilled that he gets to hear the bridegroom's voice. In the same way, I am really happy. He must become greater and I must become less important. Shondo. <laughs> so again, this is not a concept that is not rooted, that is rooted in scripture. John the Baptist, they call it the canvas strategy. 
John the Baptist was a, was a master of the canvas strategy. Be lesser, do more. I must decrease so that God can increase. I must go off the scene so that God can really step in and be who he's prophetically supposed to be in the earth. Mm -hmm. Imagine if every person you met, you thought of some way to help them or something you could do for them. And you looked at it that way and the fact that it entirely benefited them and not you. The cumulative effect this would have over time would be profound. You'd learn a great deal by solving diverse problems. You develop a reputation for being indispensable. You'd have countless new relationships. You'd have an enormous bank of favors to call on down the road. That's what the Canvas strategy is about. Helping yourself by helping others. I believe it was um, Zig Ziglar who said, you can get whatever you want in, in life when you have helped enough people get what they want in life. It's a principle, okay? Making a concerted effort to trade your short-term gratification for a longer-term payoff. Whereas everyone else wants to get credit and be respected, you can forget credit. You can forget it so hard that you're glad when others get credit instead of you. That was your aim after all. Let the others take their credit on credit while you defer and earn interest on the principal. The strategy part of it is the hardest. It is easy to be bitter like Marshall to hate even the thought of serving someone else. To despise those who have more means or more experience or even more status than you. To tell yourself every second not spent doing your work or working on yourself is a waste of your gift. To insist, I will not be demeaned like this. Once we fight this emotional and egotistical impulse, the canvas strategy is easy. The iterations are endless. Maybe it's coming up with ideas that you can hand over to your boss. Maybe it's finding people or thinkers, up and comers to introduce to each other, crossing wires to create new sparks, finding what nobody else wants to do and then doing it, finding of inefficiencies and waste and identifying leaks and patches to free up resources for new areas. Maybe it's producing more than everyone else and giving your ideas away. In other words, discover opportunities to promote creativity, find outlets and people for collaboration, eliminate distractions that hinder progress and focus. It is a rewarding and infinitely scalable power strategy. Consider each one an investment in relationship and in your own development. I think I've said this before. A lot of people are invested in buildings. And one of the things that God told me about my life is I want you to invest your life in building people. So I am a people builder. That's what I do. I like to build people. I like to encourage people. I like to educate people. I like to share my knowledge with other people so that they can be better. And I know that we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and oftentimes people are not used to people who will simply share information with them without there being some ulterior motive. Good morning, uh, husband Charles. <laughs> and so, in other words, right, the canvas strategy is there for you to utilize at any given time. There is no expiration date on it. You can start at any time before you have a job, before you're hired, while you're doing something else. If you're starting something new, when you find yourself inside of another organization without strong allies or even support. Good morning, Lady Evelyn. All right. 
This is, an, this is a strategy that you can utilize. You may even find that there's no reason to ever stop doing it. Like me, I don't see a reason to stop. Okay? Once you've graduated to heading your own projects, let it become a natural and permanent part of what you do, who you are, how you think, how you live, and how you can contribute to society, and more importantly, your own sphere around you. All right? Don't ever be too busy that you cannot stop and help somebody else. I guarantee you, I can think of plenty of times where I could have been on my way to do something, but the Holy Spirit would prompt me to stop or the Holy Spirit would prompt me to reach out to a person, right? A lot of times we get those urges of you could be just going about your day. You could be getting groceries or something and you could be standing in line and God will highlight a person and he will put a prompting in your heart to either say something to them, to greet them, to ask them how their day is doing. Something as small as that. When you begin to learn to obey those little promptings, God will give you more responsibility for greater promptings. My husband is on here. He could tell you. <laughs> Sometimes it can seem like an inconvenience at that moment. But if you pay attention to the moment, something greater will be released to you as you obey God in that prompting to care about somebody else. Because listen, I'm going to tell you this. The devil will never encourage you to care about somebody else. Let me get my lemonade. <laughs> when somebody says, well, how can I tell if it's God or not that's prompting me to, to say something? The devil is never going to prompt you to say something good. The devil is never going to prompt you to say something encouraging. He's never going to prompt you to help somebody or to encourage somebody. Okay? So think about that. The next time you feel prompted to do something good for somebody else, understand the enemy would never encourage you to do that. He would never encourage you to try to offer to better someone else's life. All right. So we had an incident the other day <clears throat> and uh, we were out doing some business. Exactly. <laughs> and he has he has remained in his life. Very good testimony, husband. So we were we were doing some errands and we were on our way to um, another event. And we were in a we were in an elevator and these. Uh, kids were kind of just like unsure as to if they should, should come to the elevator or not. And I stopped and I held the elevator open and it turned out it was not just one kid that was trying to get in the elevator, but it was five kids and um, their, their guardian. I don't know if it was a mother or grandmother. They all got into the elevator with us. And just in those few moments Literally seconds, my husband was able to encourage that entire family while we were in the elevator and begin to speak life into young black boys. And in a few seconds, with us just being in the elevator and him speaking life into them about their destiny and about who they are and about their, their value as boys, as young men, as black men, all of their faces lit up. And by the time we walked off that elevator, just a few seconds, their whole demeanor changed. Even the teenager that was standing there with his headphones on, acting like he didn't want to hear. <laughs> by the time he got off that elevator, he was smiling. He had kind of taken his headphones off and left them a little bit so he could hear what was being said. But I say all of that to say sometimes we're looking for these lengthy moments, right? Sometimes we're looking for these uh, huge, you know, fireworks and, and crowds around us kind of moments to do something as simple as speak life into another person. And sometimes all it takes is a few seconds. All it takes is a few seconds of your time 
to invest into someone else and speak life into them. And you don't know how that seed is going to germinate on the inside of them. But you have to be willing to step out of your comfort, even, even for a few minutes or a few seconds, and begin to speak life into someone else. That is what he's talking about. Sometimes it's not going to be um, where you have a, a, a long-term position, like in many of the cases with Ben Franklin and um, Bill Belichick. Sometimes you may not have a long position to be able to influence and impact people. Sometimes it's in those seconds, it's in those minutes, it's in offering to help, it's in speaking life that you can practice this strategy. And like he said, let it become natural and permanent. Okay? So you may start out trying to find avenues, but if you keep doing it, it will become natural to the kind of person that you are. I always want to be known as the person who is helpful. <laughs> okay? I That is my goal in life. That's one of my life principles. I want to be known as a person who is helpful, as a person who is a resource, or if I don't have the resource, I can point you in the direction of your resources that you need. That is my life principle. That's the kind of person that I want to be. All right. So I hope that this has been helpful for you today. The last thing he says here, he says this, let this become natural and permanent. Let others apply it to you while you're too busy applying it to those above you and on your level. Because if you pick up this mantle once, you'll see what most people's egos prevent them from appreciating. The person who clears the path ultimately controls its direction just as the canvas shapes the painting. Think about that. If you are just coming in, I encourage you to go back and listen to this entire replay as we talk today about the canvas strategy. How do you become a person of influence? You become a person of influence by being the kind of person that clears the way for others, not just so you can look good or not just so they can look good, but so that they can be good, so that they can be better because you came along and you offered help. You offered guidance. You got your ego out of the way. You learned to sit down and be humble. <laughs> no matter how good you think you are, no matter how good of an attitude you think you have, this strategy will challenge even your attitude. It will help you to see what is it on the inside of me that needs improvement. Because if I cannot learn to serve people with joy, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep serving other people until I am learning to serve with joy. Until I am learning to serve people with no ulterior motive. Until I am learning to serve people and I enjoy helping other people. That I really do want the best for everybody that's around me. And that everybody that's connected to me. That I don't want to be the person that is a hindrance as opposed to a help. So this is Daring Dialogues. I hope that you will join us on Monday for our Monday motivation. We are going to be looking at, where is that book? There it is. All right. Monday motivation. We're going to be looking at the Simplest Way to Change the World. Awesome book, and I can't wait to share it with you on Monday. It's talking about biblical hospitality as a way of life. Biblical hospitality as a way of life. In other words, how can we use the Canvas strategy more effectively? And also, we're going to begin Tony Evans' book, Kingdom Disciples, Heaven's Representatives on Earth. We're going to be learning how to be better kingdom disciples. And we're going to be learning the fact that everyone is called to be a kingdom disciple. So, doesn't matter your title in the kingdom. 
doesn't matter your rank in the kingdom. The reality is we are all kingdom disciples. Okay. We are all kingdom disciples. So we want to be, and we want to get better at doing that. All right. Giveaways today. Giveaways today. I have <clears throat> a uh, lovely, lovely women's pouch here. You can take and you can put some of your items in. I have some writing material for you and a matching tablet that goes with that. And my other giveaway for today, I've got some lovely folders to organize your writings. Okay, in any of your note taking and plans. Just says follow your dreams along with a set of color gel pens and of course a composition journal. So my question is, where was I reading from today? Where was I reading from today? And I'm not talking about tools of titans. I'm talking about what passage was I reading from today? All right. And if you know the answer, you got to email me at reachshante, reachshante at gmail.com. So the first two people that I receive emails from who can tell me what passage of scripture I was reading from. And here's a hint. He said, he must, I must decrease so that he might increase. So if you can tell me where I was reading from today, I'll take the first two emails with that answer and I will get your information and send you these free gifts. All right. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues. I hope that you are having a great and wonderful Friday. We'll be back here on Periscope Sunday at 2.30 p.m. I will be bringing the message this Sunday. So stay tuned and I hope that you will join us on the weekend. All right. Take care. Have a great and wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you all for tuning in.